Um, I, don't, I don't know about you. Have you guys ever been on a trip that you were really looking forward to? Um, like maybe it was the beach or for some of us, Disney World. Some people love Disney World. Uh, ben is an anti-Disney person. He's never been to Disney, but he keeps telling me how terrible it is, even though he's never been there. Um, but like the beach, you guys look, you, you got like a six hour drive, right? And then your GPS tells you like you got like five more miles till you're going to be there. And then it feels like those last five miles are eternity. Um, I remember when we I took our kids to Disney World for the first time. And you get up super early, you make your flight, you fly on this plane with kids, that's fun, right? And so it already feels like it's long. And then you get off the plane and you're in Florida, I'm like in Orlando, it should be two minutes and I'm with Mickey Mouse, right? That's what my mind said. And you get out of the airport, or no, you land in the airport, it takes you 45 minutes to get through the airport, another hour to find your bus. You find your bus, it takes about 40 minutes to load your bus, right? And then it takes another 35 minutes for the bus to go about four miles so you can get to your resort. And then you got to check in for another six hours. You guys know what I'm talking about. Like, you feel like I'm about to be there, but I'm not really there yet. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, spiritually and in our life, like we feel like God's given us a destination um, or a journey or a, or a mission to be on. Like, this is who I am. Maybe this is the gifts God's put inside of me. These are the purposes for my life. This is where I'm going. These are my plans. And then we start to walk in those plans and we start to see little things pop up that encourage our plans and say, you were almost there. Have you guys ever, like, drove down south and seen the south of the border signs. You guys know what I'm talking about? South of the border. For like a hundred and some miles, you're like, you're almost there. A cheap shopping mall with a bunch of random artifacts, and or not artifacts, like toys and stuff. I don't know. But you see it forever, and you're never quite there. I feel like some ways my entire life has been that. Like, God, I know you have plans and purposes for me. You, I know you have things you want me to do, but I feel like I'm always almost there but never quite there. And I think if we have the wrong perspective, we'll always see ourselves as never quite there. And truthfully, we might already be there. We might be exactly where God wants us to be in that moment, even though we know that there's something beyond. God's saying, hey, don't worry about the beyond. It's because of the beyond that you can fully be where you are right now. You can be on mission and at present with God and purposeful right in this place even though you have visions and prophetic words and stirrings about something beyond. If you constantly are waiting for the next thing, you'll always be disgruntled with where you currently are. Make sense? Go with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're, gonna, we're walking through the life of Jesus in this new series. We want to see Jesus. We want to behold him. We want to ask him, what does it look like to live like you on the earth? What does it mean that you lived on the earth and, and brought your presence to us? And so Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse, uh, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John. This is John the Baptist here that we just talked about last week. To be baptized by him, by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Chapter 4, verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the, up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. We're going to pause there. So here's, here's Jesus, right? John the Baptist, prepare the way. Here he comes. Jesus shows up. Hey, I'm going to fulfill this thing. Baptize me. He comes out of the water, right? He comes out of the water, and the, the heavens open up. And there's people around, and there's witnesses to this event, to this moment. And God says from the heavens, this is my son, I love him. I'm happy with him. He's done everything right. I am well pleased with him. He's mine. And the Holy Spirit comes in the form of a dove and sits on him. Talk about an epic moment, right? If you were wondering, should I follow this guy? And the skies open up. You all hear the voice of God audibly tell you this is mine. 
I'm happy with him, and a dove ascends on him, I would take that as a pretty clear kind. This guy's about to do work, right? Like, this is the guy I should follow. This is the one that I should, like, drop what I'm doing because he's way cooler than I am. Like, that's never happened to me. I don't know if that ever happened to you. Probably not. You, you jump out of the swimming pool, the heavens open, say, hey, this is my guy, right? It hasn't happened. Jesus, it happened. They were waiting for it to happen. It happens. If there's a moment for Jesus to be publicly exalted, this is it, right? This is the moment. God puts his mark of approval on him. And here's what everybody's expecting. Here he is. Let's get that political rally going. Jesus is our new king. Jesus is our new president. Jesus is the man. Jesus is God's son. Let's get this rally going. But there's no rally. There's no formation of some army for Jesus to overthrow Rome, to take over the king of the Jews. He, he, there's, there's none of that. He's not bursting into any temple to tell the religious hypocrites and Pharisees how they got it all wrong. And here's God's son that God is pleased with, with the Holy Spirit sitting like a dove on his shoulder. He doesn't show up to the temple and say, guys, I'm, it's my turn now. Get out of the way. He doesn't do any of that. They were expecting that, but they got it wrong. Instead, Jesus says, Holy Spirit, where do you want to go? says, not where the flesh says, not the way they thought he would come and rule and reign, not the way they thought he would be exalted. Instead, God exalted him through temptation and through humiliation and through humility. See, God's here to fulfill his plans. Jesus came, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, came to fulfill his plans. He has not come to fulfill all of ours. I was reading N.T. Wright talking about this, and he said, even the prophets were confused by this. I'm talking about John the Baptist, who we just talked about last week. Remember, John the Baptist, here he comes. I can't tie your shoes. Jesus, I shouldn't baptize you. You are too epic. God shows up. Boom, voice from the sky, right? Guys, follow him. Follow him. He's about to do work. And later on, John's like in chains. Are you... Are, were you the one? Did we miss the point? Because I'm waiting for the overthrow. I'm waiting for the coup. I'm waiting for the army to rise up. I'm waiting for the prison walls to open. I'm waiting for you to be seated on a throne. And I still see you wandering around talking to kids and healing the lame and being with prostitutes and sinners and, and the broken and the poor. And I don't see you ruling and reigning in authority or power yet. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm healing. I'm moving. I'm doing something that you don't understand. Even the prophetic voices in the Old Testament, they were right, but they missed how he was going to do it. There was an expectation of worldly power, and Jesus says, I'm bringing heavenly power. I'm bringing something different. I'm, I'm, risking, I'm risking the Facebook trolls coming out right now with what I'm about to say. All right, And I, just so you know, I don't respond to Facebook. Um, if you want to have a conversation or a dialogue with me, do it in person. I will gladly chat with you in person about anything you disagree with. You talk, to, talk about something on Facebook, I will ignore it. I don't interact with social media. Like, maybe I, maybe I, shouldn't, I should be more involved with social media. I'm just not. But let me say this. When we have talked about the meekness, the humility, the beauty of the gospel, the way that we see Christ here, we, we have been accused of promoting a wimpy Jesus. Let me tell you, there is no wimpy Jesus, there is no Rambo Jesus, there is Jesus. Jesus, his authority does not look our, like our authority. 
Jesus' strength does not look like human might. Jesus' weakness does not look like human weaknesses. Jesus has no weakness. He is just simply Jesus. He's not Rambo with swords and shields and bazookas and, and a loud screaming voice, and he is not a quiet little church mouse hiding in the corner. He is Jesus, exalted. And he says, it's not your way, mankind. It is my way, my kingdom. And my kingdom looks different than your kingdom. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, he spells it all out. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Theirs is the kingdom. They are the ones that inherit the earth. This is the Jesus we're talking about. This is the Jesus we see here when they are expecting Jesus to rise up because he's been anointed by God. Instead, he goes to the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. It doesn't make sense. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. If the, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their head, hands, you will bear, they will bear you up, lest you're, you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve, and only him shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This passage, there's a lot happening here. And one of the things I want to point out, that word Satan, the definition for it, the other way of understanding it, the actual word means accuser. Jesus says, get out of here, accuser. We see in scripture that he is the accuser of the brethren, that he comes to us with accusation. He doesn't come to us with truth. He comes to us with lies. He doesn't come to us with promise. Does it make sense? And what, is, what happens here? Jesus is just told publicly, you are the son of God and I'm pleased with you. The Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness and he's beginning to fast for 40 days. And it's in that place that the accuser comes to him and says, I don't know if you are the son of God. Because if you're the son of God, you're hungry. And you'd think God would feed you. How about you take matters into your own hands? If you were the son of God, do something. Make these, make these stones bread and fill that void in your stomach. Fill that pain that you feel. Take things into your own hands and fix it yourself. If you are who you think you are, fix it. And I would say that, God, that, that the enemy tries to do the same thing to us with the words that God has spoken over us. Scripture says that we are sons and daughters, that we are wa washed white as snow, that our sins are removed from us. We don't wear accusation. We don't wear guilt and shame because we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Like, it's his righteousness that we wear. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? That's what Scripture says. That's my identity biblically. But the enemy comes and says, hey, if you are that, don't you feel like you should have a little bit more? Don't you feel like... God would give you the things that you're craving right now. And so here's what happens. Well, maybe, maybe it's not actual bread. You're not walking around hungry. Maybe you are, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're not hungry in this season, but maybe your emotional well-being, maybe your sense of like affirmation is just dropped. Like you don't have a relationship. Like you don't have that guy or that girl to fill your tank. You don't have that connectivity. Maybe you don't have that prestige or that authority. You don't have that. So there's something else that's like a void, like a hunger in your heart that you feel is really empty. And you're like, if I'm a son of God, if I'm a daughter of God, don't I deserve to have this thing filled more? So let me take things into my own hands. Let me find the wrong relationship quickly. Let me get the, the apps out. Let me find that, that sexual relationship. Let me find that sense of, of, of fulfillment through these drug cravings or these addictions or, or maybe it's things. Maybe it's uh, whatever it is. You guys know what I'm talking about. These little cravings that we tell ourselves we deserve for some reason. 
And so we take matters into our own hands. I've, to, I've, I've encountered in, in dealing with marriages where people have said to me, don't I deserve my princess? Don't I deserve my prince? Don't I deserve a happy, happy ever after? They're married. They're in a covenantal biblical relationship. There's no abuse. There's no infidelity. And they want me to tell them, yeah, you deserve to go find another on the side. Take things into your own hands. Go find a new spouse. Get a divorce. Figure it all out because you deserve that. Because you're a prince and you deserve a princess. What they're doing is saying there's a hunger in here that that person's not meeting and I got to do things my way even though God says that has never been my way. It's not about your plans, it's about his plans. You guys, you guys see what I'm saying? We do this with a lot of different things where we take matters into our own hands and Jesus in this moment, he, see, he feels this hunger. I mean, if I, go, if I miss lunch, I'm hangry, right? I need a Snickers, right? That's the commercial. I, I need a Snickers, I turn into somebody else. If I miss lunch, Jesus, 40 days, no food. This is a pretty, pretty, pretty big growl happening here. He might be past the point of growl, right? I was sick for 20 days a few years back, and I lost 20 pounds. Worst 20 pounds I've ever lost. I made sure to bring it all right back. Like, and Jesus is in that frailty. Like, there's pictures of me doing baptisms when I was sick then. And I, like, looked white. Like, white, white. Like, I'm white. But I, I looked really, really white back then. And that, it was not a good place in, place in my life. And that was, like, 20 days of not eating. Jesus has fasted 40 days. And he doesn't listen to the accusation. He sees the accusation. And he says, here's what God says. Here's what God's word is over me. The next part, part, hey, Jesus, if you are the son of God, uh, how about you show us by showing how powerful you are? How, how about you reveal how great you are? You should act impressive, not humble or obedient. Why, why be obedient? You should, you should display this. If, God, if you're the son of God, jump off of here and command some angels. Do something cool. Prove it. Avoid the painful process in front of you. And void the path to the cross. Instead, take over and demonstrate that you are who you say you are. You are who God says you are. Do something about it. In, our, in a similar way, you and I face that accusation every day. If you are God's and if you have been given authority in heaven, if you have this promise of eternal life, if you know the truth, then how about you prove it? How about, how about you prove it? How about you do things in arrogance rather than walk in humility? How about you get angry and, and hostile rather than forgiving and merciful? That was put to a test in my heart this weekend. Everybody who helped me move knows what I'm talking about. We're buying a house, and, and our, the, the homeowners are awesome friends of ours, Christian friends of ours. Great examples of humility and meekness. They were promised one thing. They were promised that they would, the movers would be there on Thursday. Get them all out on Thursday so we could buy the house and be there on Friday. Well, Friday afternoon comes around and they still aren't there. We show up at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoon with my team ready to go. And the movers are just kind of like doing their own thing. And one lie after another by the moving company. And it turns into they are not out of the house with half of their stuff that they're supposed to have at 7 p.m. And then they're mad at us for being in the way trying to move our stuff in, right? You guys, you guys who were there know what I'm talking about. Inside of me, I was ready to throw down. <laughs> at 12 o'clock, I was technically the homeowner. And I was ready to say to the moving company, I own this property. Move your butts. Keep your word. And get the heck out of here. Like, that's what was happening inside of me, Right? And there was a moment where I did, I did mention, because he said to us, the one guy said, hey, um, how much longer are you going to do this because our guys are ready? And I said, you were supposed to be done here yesterday. And he said, we wouldn't get a contract till yesterday. So it led into a whole new world, right? But there was this moment where I just wanted to go off. And I'm watching Paul and Beth, and I'm like, when are you going to go off? Because it's your money. It's not my money. It's your money. And I watched them keep their mouth shut, and they said, we'll get this figured out. We'll get this figured out. And I... I 
there, in, and I'm, I'm not saying we Christians are doormats. Hear me. I'm not saying we get taken advantage of and let it happen. But Jesus did say, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, give the extra cloak, didn't he? Right? You guys with me this morning? This is countercultural. This is counter might. This is counter us. If you are gods, then why don't you prove it? Why don't you take up the sword? Why don't you take off a few heads? Why don't you throw out a few lawsuits? Why don't you spell, spill out a few accusatory words? Why don't you make them feel like garbage so that you can feel great? Why don't you do this if you are so good? Does that make sense? That temptation is right in front of Jesus. And then the next one, all right, Jesus, if you're son of God, don't you deserve a little more power? How about you change gods? Father hasn't given you authority yet. If you worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms, everything you see. First of all, it wasn't Satan's to give. Secondly, Satan thought, if I can get him to avoid the path of the cross, he won't do what he was sent for. If I can get him to miss his mission and to worship me, it's all mine. So often, God places this journey in front of us and we can only see the pain and we don't see the opportunity for growth or transformation or fulfilling his purposes. We forget that he has plans that far surpass our current plans, that he's doing a work that is way more beautiful than anything we could put together on our own. And in those moments, you and I have an opportunity to respond, and we either respond with God's words or we respond with our own. And every time the accuser comes at Jesus, Jesus responds with the gospel. He responds with the words of scripture. Actually, all of them are out of Deuteronomy. Jesus knew what God had said, and it was in here even to the point where Satan uses the words of scripture back at Jesus, and Jesus says, I know too much about the words of God to know that you're using them wrong. So let me tell you how to actually use them. This happens in the church a lot. We will use scripture to propel and support our selfishness, right? Rather than understanding the context of scripture and listening to the Holy Spirit to know how to apply that scripture. Satan knows the scripture better than most of us do. The enemy, the accuser knows the word. Scripture says the demons know the word. We need to be people who know it and then are led by the Spirit. If you're not led by the Spirit, the words will just be words. But if you're led by the Spirit, it will be truth and life. And this is what believers have to take on the mantle of. Can we discern, can we rightly divide the word so that in every situation, we look like Jesus and we're pursuing the plans that God has for us, not the plans that serve us selfishly. Jesus embraced this path of humility and servanthood while fully understanding his position as God and king. Jesus was God in the flesh, right? He's king. He is, he is the line of David. He's the one whose throne will never end. He is king. He knows his plans. He knows who he is, and he still embraces the path of humility and servanthood. Those two places can exist. You can know that you are God's chosen son and daughter and yet suffer and walk in humility and receive accusation from outside and speak blessing back. Just because I hear accusation and don't respond in anger and hostility, just because I feel worthless and don't respond in pride or self-performance or self motivate whatever, I can still know that I am beloved by the Father, that he has set me. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. That's my reality, and I can also be humble and meek and serve. Let me say this. This morning, Paul, I text Paul, my friend who moved, I said, because he's preaching in St. Louis this morning. And I said, Paul, I'm praying for you and your church. I pray that your family made it there safely and that you guys are doing well. And he responded, I left my phone over there. He responded by saying he's truly blessed by watching us and our church walk in grace and humility toward him. No complaining, and they served his family. You, the church, those who helped us move, helped Paul move when he had hired movers to do it for him. He was truly blessed by humility that you guys displayed. 
you guys could have all stood around complaining, and I probably was the biggest stirrer of complaints because I was getting really frustrated, and I felt like my friend was being taken advantage of. But you guys are like, it's okay, we're good, we're good, we're here, whatever. Twelve hours some of you spent. On, on a Friday, I mean, it's COVID season, so you couldn't go to any parties or anything anyway, so it was the closest we had to a party in like ten months. It was great. Kidding, kind of. Let me ask a question, though. What's the price that would cause you to forget the words that God has spoken over your life and sell, sell out? The words that God has spoken, because here's the words that God said over you. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are empowered, you are accepted. And we know this through God's word. Jesus uses the word of God to respond to the accusation of the enemy. And so my encouragement for you this morning, if we're going to look at Jesus, we're going to see the humility of Jesus in this moment where you think he would come out with swords or guns ablazing or whatever, or political insight or religious insight and uprising. When you think he would take over, he goes to the wilderness by the Spirit and he responds to the accusation with the words of God through Scripture. You and I have to jump into his word in this season. We have to walk in true identity, not manipulation. Because each one of us will wake up every day and the enemy will want to manipulate how you think, how you feel, how you respond. Can we go to Hebrews chapter 4? Worship team, you guys can come forward. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us this in verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through heaven. Jesus, the son of God. There's that phrase. Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What I want to encourage you with this morning is that whatever you're walking through, whatever accusation is at you, Jesus knows. He's felt it. He's been there. He's walked through it. He's set the model in front of us. He's, he's not sinned even though he's felt anything you can possibly feel, he has taken that on and endured. We have a great high priest who is familiar. He knows our grieving. I love the scripture. I think it's John eleven thirty five. 35. It's a classic one to go to if you grew up in a Christian uh, school and you're given a memory verse. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Jesus is so familiar with our struggle, with our temptation, with our hurts, with our wounds, with our voids, with our, our feeling of, of lack, of worthlessness. And, and yet, he never sinned because he also knew who he was. The Father said, you are mine and I am pleased with you. Jesus hadn't done a miracle. Jesus hadn't done anything at that point. He was simply was God's son. He's been there. Maybe, maybe your temptation that you're walking through, maybe, maybe the struggle, maybe the frustration, maybe your grief, maybe whatever it is that you're walking through, you can't find in scriptures Jesus doing that exact same thing. And, and that's, that's all right. But it all comes back to, are we committed to serving him and his plans or are we committed to self-indulgence and self-preservation? Every stress, every temptation comes back to that. Are we willing to trust him or do we got to trust ourselves? Do we take his way or we take our way? Which it's his back and forth and he has faced that, that question over and over again. And it didn't end with this passage. I mean, I think, I think of Jesus interacting with the Pharisees. Like constantly having religious zealots in his ear. Every time he's doing something, he's healing on the Sabbath. He's eating grain on the Sabbath. And they're like just pointing fingers and calling him out. If I was Jesus and I had that kind of authority, I'd be like, zip it. And they'd be, all be mute. I'd just like do that. You know what I'm talking about? Like just their mouths are stuck together. 
Or, or I just like, I mean, he cast demons into pigs and the pigs, pigs jumped off a cliff. I would probably be doing, that, be doing that with the religious guys. Zip it, get in those pigs, get off the cliff. But he doesn't do any of that. He, he was tempted over and over again. It just wasn't here. But every time he met it and he wasn't sinful because he pursued the path of the Father, he was led by the Holy Spirit. I love that it says, hey, guys, our high priest has already been tempted in everything, and so now you boldly come to the throne of grace. What that means is he's already done it, and so when I fail, I don't wallow and say, I can't do it because I'm not like Jesus. What I do is I come to the throne room again, and I say, let your grace and your mercy wash over me because I failed. But I still have him in front of me. I'm still pursuing this thing. You're not done with me yet. Does that make sense? Some of you guys feel like you've failed every temptation. You've just got a hot anger problem. You've got greed and lust problem. You've got self-worth problem. You've got all the problems, right? You just feel like you've got all the problems. But Scripture says, hey, cool, that's that's all right. Jesus knows what you're you're feeling. Now come into grace. Come into the throne room in grace. He's got it figured out. He, He knows. He knows. It's all right. Come into grace. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Talk about a church that needed grace. This church was a mess. They were celebrating incest. They were getting drunk off of communion, right? This is that church. They were using spiritual gifts as gifts of arrogance. And here's what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except that is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you are able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, it's a term of endearment, a term of affirmation, a term of you are my family. You're not rejects. You're not cast off. You're not abandoned. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. What is idolatry? Take it on my way, not his way. I'm going after other gods, not, not the God. He says this. He says, hey, Scripture tells us in Hebrews, he's already beat temptation. Now in Corinthians, he's telling the family who's messed up over and over again, hey, how about you recognize that when the tempter comes, God is faithful enough to give you a way to escape it. There is always a way out. And so maybe it's simply like Jesus saying, I know the Scripture. Here's the words. I'm going to continue on. I push through. Or may, or may, I don't know what it is, but anytime you're, you're tempted, God is right there with a the way out. Right there with a the way out because he's faithful. God will do, do so much more with you walking in humility than you will ever be able to do in your own pride or talent. And, and so often we create these, these itineraries for our lives. But he takes us on a completely different journey than we expected. And the enemy, the accuser, will try to take us off that journey. You guys still with me this morning? Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. And they were supposed to be a representation. They were supposed to part that sea, come through the waters out of Egypt. And they were supposed to look like God and go into the promised land. And and he kept giving them miracle after miracle, and they kept messing it all up, right? Jesus comes, and he parts the water of the Jordan, and he faithfully reflects the Father in ways that Israel never could. And I I love this, that Jesus goes right into the wilderness to look like the Father. It's in the wilderness he looks the most like the Father, I think. It's that moment. Maybe, I, I really do think that this is the most powerful moment in the ministry of Jesus because instead of him responding in pride to what he just heard coming out of the water he responds in humility and sets the path for the rest of his time on the earth and I would even say that Paul the apostle right you guys know the story the road and he's blinded Jesus shows up he's blinded and he converted he has this major conversion and he's God says, I'm about to do work in you. I got a mission for you. Opens his eyes. If I'm Paul, the religious zealot who spent my entire life following the law, I'm ready to do work. You know what Paul did? He went to the wilderness. I think for about 16 years, most scholars think. I would say that's probably the most impactful part of Paul's ministry because it set his heart 
for what he's about to endure. Paul didn't get arrogant. He didn't get prideful. Jesus didn't get arrogant. He didn't get prideful, right? He endured the wilderness. Maybe the wilderness is the most important mission you and I can be in. Maybe 2020, 2021 is the most significant season of our lives because we are saying it's not my way, it's his way. It's not my desires and needs and ambitions. It's your path, your plans. Maybe this is the space that we could be most powerful for the kingdom because it doesn't feel like the kingdom. I mean, just like I said earlier, a hundred, like packing this place out as a pastor makes me feel like, all right, we're doing work. And then last week there's like 20 people here and I'm like, oh, the ship is burning. We're all going down, right? That's what the flesh feels like. Maybe it's in the middle of this weird season that God's checking each of our hearts and saying, are you on mission right now or not? Are, Are you, are you, how are we responding? This year, would you stand with me? Not this year, would you stand with me? This, like, that was two separate thoughts, I apologize. This year, you have a journey in front of you. God has given each one of you purposes and missions. But I want to encourage you that your purposes are just as real right now if it feels like a wilderness season, if it feels like a season of high temptation, You have a journey in front of you. You have an advocate, Jesus, who has gone before you. You have a way of escape because our God is faithful. You have the word to put in your heart. You have right now everything you need to serve the Father the same way that Jesus did. This year, right now, in this moment, you have everything you need to serve like Jesus. What are you and I going to do in the wilderness? I mean, if it was me, right? And the flesh, talking about fleshly Jesse, not spirit Jesse. And I have this great word, the heavens open. And next thing you know, I'm spending 40 days in the wilderness and the enemies tell me, hey, you can turn stones to bread. I'm probably mad at God. And those stones are looking really tasty. You know what I'm saying? But i got to live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. That's what Paul says over and over and over again in Galatians. We live by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. We don't walk by the flesh. We keep our eyes on the fact that God is faithful and he's doing a work that we don't even see. You, I want to encourage you with this morning. God is doing a work that you don't know or see. So just hang in there. You have everything you need to keep going through. This is going to be a beautiful year. I firmly believe that. And then the part of the beauty is going to look like wilderness, and that's fully okay. This is one of my favorite parts of the scripture because it shows it wasn't all like this great rise to victory story with Jesus. In fact, it ends with the cross. That's the path that you and I get to take. It's a privilege to take. Let's worship for a few minutes.